very few researchers in the region, many farmers, many problems. So if we, if we encourage farmers to become researchers and we help them to conduct research on their own, own farms, you'll be making a huge impact out there in the farming community. People are now systematically pursuing research that is more relevant, research that is more impactful. And even in that context, we need also the extension element so that the research and the technology generated is also transmitted to practitioners. Uh, a faculty not only of food or agriculture, but also a broader faculty that encompasses environmental issues and, and nutritional issues uh, should be put together in, in a single unit. The Department of Agricultural Economics and Extension houses several disciplines. We do agribusiness management, we do human ecology, and we do agricultural um, extension. All graduates occupy several key positions in the region. In fact, the department sees its role as producing the human resources in these areas for regional impact. And so they occupy areas in agriculture, good institutions, FAO, um, they occupy places in the hospital as dietitians, and they occupy places in policy, but our extension officers, trained graduates are also within the region providing those kind of expert services for, for companies and for governments. We worked in St. Vincent because under the fair trade banana system, farmers were having a problem. They couldn't use weedicides or any kind of pesticides at all, so we had to find a natural solution to their problem. A team of us from the faculty went up there and we we engage farmers in a participatory research and development process. Under the system, they identified a, a, a species, a, another crop that they can grow in their bananas that will effectively control the weed that they were having. And this crop ad actually adds nutrients to the soil. So instead of spending money on inorganic pesticides and weedicides, they were actually growing another crop to reduce the weeds and to even add fertilizers, nutrients to their soil. We have been doing some of the most pioneering work on breadfruit, uh, Dr. Roberts uh, and Krumer, for example, treating with dwarf varieties, new introduction of new varieties of, of breadfruit. When I started work on breadfruit, it was in the first instance to expand the germplasm. That's just the range of cultivars that we have in the region. Everybody knows about yellow and white. I went to Hawaii where there is the world's largest collection of germplasm in 1990 and collected additional cultivars. The research has focused on evaluation of the imported versus the existing cultivars that we have in the Caribbean. And so we have been looking at breadfruit not just as any ordinary starch, but a starch that is low in terms of its glycemic index, relatively lower than the cereals, and that is important for diabetes mellitus control, all right, um, for hypertension control, that is looking at some of the medicinal properties of the breadfruit leaf. The area in which I work is called post-production technology. We focus on after primary production. After the commodity is harvested, what do you do with it? Which is where the value is really added, with the intent to extend and maximize the shelf life so that you can get a marketable commodity and maximize returns. The other aspect of what we do is called value addition. That is, we find ways to utilize the commodity. We focus on underutilized fruits and vegetables horticultural commodities. One of the most important things we make with a lot of potential is flour. The important aspect of it is that we can substitute the wheat flour with any of these flours depending on what we're doing. So whether it's sweet potato or breadfruit or cassava flour. I have been working in food processing and food quality and safety and uh, we have been looking at the quality of foods and the foodborne pathogens, particularly like in street foods where we look at the prevalence of gastroenteritis in Trinidad and Tobago. There was a lot of under-reporting of pe people will just stay home and do not go to the doctor and there is also the economic aspect of it in that there is a cost of medicine and also being away from work. I've been doing research for the last 30 years on small ruminant production, that is sheep and goat production. The intensive um, production system has 
two aspects of it. One is the modification of the environment that will reduce heat stress on the animals. Second thing is the fact that um, animals that are being grazed have serious problems with the quality and quantity of um, feed. We here at the university have been researching on using um, byproduct type feeds and also um, local high protein forages so that assist the farmers in being able to enhance in production and of course protein security. The Department of Geography is developing research into some of the most pressing environmental and social issues of our time. We are developing research into natural hazards and the interactions of people with the environment and, and flood risk and some of the social problems that it causes. Geographers look at issues such as sustainable development and climate change at a variety of spatial and temporal scales using both physical and social science methods. Cowany Flood Risk Project is an example of such research. It's using community-based vulnerability assessments where the community's experiences of flooding are placed front and centre in combination with a physically-based computational model of flood inundation which enables us to assess where is that flood risk. As a human geographer, I'm, I'm particularly interested in social justice. So the research that I'm doing is focused on street dwellers, housing, education, school dropouts. One of the most interesting things that we've seen coming out of street dwellers is how they occupy space. So for instance, their daily residential mobility from one part of the country to another, and the fact that although we might see them in major urban centers, they might actually originate from rural parts of the country. And that's where a geographical perspective is very important. So we might think that school dropouts are in areas that are most commonly associated with crime, but when we actually look at it from a spatial perspective, we can see that in areas that don't have the infrastructure in rural areas and areas of south and east, that there is a high propensity for dropping out. And so the spatial justice and the social justice aspects are, are relevant. Climate change has many different facets. There's the scientific aspect, um, temperature rise, sea level rise and so on. But then there's the socio-economic aspect, impacts on people's lives and income and employment. I also focused on coming up with some adaptation strategies that can be used by farmers, communities and at the national level. And many countries in the Caribbean have used the output of the research to help them review their domestic policies on agriculture and climate change and also to help them to um, negotiate or try to get aid in trying to cope with climate change impacts. Food security is really defined at the family level. It's access to nutritious food all the time. Well, we have a mandate to work right across the Caribbean with all farmers, large or small. We've been doing this for many years now, so we are pretty good at, and pretty good at doing it. And so we think this is the nature of our impact. And in the foreseeable future, we do it more extensively. And we show students how to do this at the household level so they can go home and do it for themselves or if they so wish, if they have the entrepreneurial spirit in them, they can make it into small businesses. But the whole idea is that we can utilize at a far greater extent the commodities that we produce in the Caribbean and therefore increase the amount or the percentage of the commodities that we use as food that are produced right here regionally and reduce the amount of imported input into our food supply.